Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the January 2022 edition. Actually, this is the first video I'm recording in 2022, so for whatever that's worth. And it's an audiobook and discussion of Wage, Labor, and Capital by Karl Marx with an introduction by Friedrich Engels. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe and consider supporting on Patreon at patreon.com slash socialism for all. So this is the Marxist's Internet Archive version of Wage, Labor, and Capital. Thanks, as usual, to Marxists.org, the Marxist's Internet Archive, for hosting this and thousands of other free Marxist texts. Please go check them out. So Wage, Labor, and Capital was originally delivered December 1847, and Engels' introduction is going to expand more on the origins of this pamphlet, so hang on for that. The source is Wage, Labor, and Capital, the original 1891 pamphlet, edited, translated by Friedrich Engels, first published in German in the Neue Rheinische Zeitung, April 5 through 8 and 11, 1849. The online version is courtesy of the Marx-Engels Internet Archive at marxists.org, 1993-1999, HTML transcription and markup by Zodiac and Brian Baggins, proofed and corrected by Alec Blaine, 2006. So, we'll read the table of contents. There are a number of sections. First, the introduction, then a preliminary section, then what are wages, then by what is the price of a commodity determined, then by what are wages determined, then the nature and growth of capital, then the relation of wage labor to capital, then the general law that determines the rise and fall of wages and profit, then the interests of capital and wage labor are diametrically opposed, then the effect of capitalist competition on the capitalist class, middle class, and working class. So let's get into it, starting with the introduction to Karl Marx's Wage, Labor, and Capital by Friedrich Engels. This pamphlet first appeared in the form of a series of leading articles in the Neue Rheinische Zeitung, beginning on April 4, 1849. The text is made up from lectures delivered by Marx before the German Working Men's Club of Brussels in 1847. The series was never completed. The promise to be continued at the end of the editorial in number 269 of the newspaper remained unfulfilled in consequence of the precipitous events of that time, the invasion of Hungary by the Russians, Tsar's troops invaded Hungary in 1849 to keep the Austrian Habsburg dynasty in power, and the uprisings in Dresden, Iserlohn, Elberfeld, the Palatinate, and in Baden. Note, spontaneous uprisings in Germany in May to July 1849, supporting the imperial constitution, which were crushed in mid-July, which led to the suppression of the paper on May 19, 1849. And among the papers left by Marx, no manuscript of any continuation of these articles has been found. Wage Labor and Capital has appeared as an independent publication in several editions, the last of which was issued by the Swiss Cooperative Printing Association in Hotten Zurich in 1884. Hitherto, the several editions have contained the exact wording of the original articles, but since at least 10,000 copies of the present edition are to be circulated as a propaganda tract, the question necessarily forced itself upon me. Would Marx himself, under these circumstances, have approved of an unaltered literal reproduction of the original? Marx, in the 40s, had not yet completed his criticism of political economy. This was not done until toward the end of the 50s. Consequently, such of his writings as were published before the first installment of his critique of political economy was finished deviate in some points from those written after 1859 and contain expressions and whole sentences which, viewed from the standpoint of his later writings, appear inexact and even incorrect. Now, it goes without saying that in ordinary editions, intended for the public in general, this earlier standpoint, as part of the intellectual development of the author, has its place, that the author, as well as the public, has an indisputable right to an unaltered reprint of these older writings. In such a case, I wouldn't have dreamed of changing a single word in it, but it is otherwise when the edition is destined almost exclusively for the purpose of propaganda. In such a case, Marx himself would unquestionably have brought the old work, dating from 1849, into harmony with his new point of view, and I feel sure that I am acting in his spirit when I insert in this edition the few changes and additions which are necessary in order to attain this object in all essential points. 
Therefore, I say to the reader at once, this pamphlet is not as Marx wrote it in 1849, but approximately as Marx would have written it in 1891. Moreover, so many copies of the original text are in circulation that these will suffice until I can publish it again, unaltered, in a complete edition of Marx's works to appear at some future time. My alterations center about one point. According to the original reading, the worker sells his labor for wages, which he receives from the capitalist. According to the present text, he sells his labor power, and for this change, I must render an explanation to the workers in order that they may understand that we are not quibbling or word juggling, but are dealing here with one of the most important points in the whole range of political economy, to the bourgeois in order that they may convince themselves how greatly the uneducated workers, who can be easily made to grasp the most difficult economic analyses, excel our supercilious, quote, cultured folk, for whom such ticklish problems remain insoluble their whole life long. Classical political economy borrowed from the industrial practice the current notion of the manufacturer, that he buys and pays for the labor of his employees. And there's a footnote there on classical political economy. This is quoting Marx from Capital, Volume 1. By classical political economy, I understand that economy which, since the time of W. Petty, has investigated the real relations of production in bourgeois society, in contradistinction to vulgar economy, which deals with appearances only, ruminates without ceasing on the materials long since provided by scientific economy, and there seeks plausible explanations of the most obtrusive phenomena for bourgeois daily use, but for the rest confines itself to systematizing in a pedantic way and proclaiming for everlasting truths trite ideas held by the self-complacent bourgeoisie with regard to their own world, to them the best of all possible worlds. End of quote, back to the text. This conception had been quite serviceable for the business purposes of the manufacturer, his bookkeeping and price calculation, but naively carried over into political economy, it there produced truly wonderful errors and confusions. Political economy finds it an established fact that the prices of all commodities, among them the price of the commodity which it calls labor, continually change, that they rise and fall in consequence of the most diverse circumstances, which often have no connection whatsoever with the production of the commodities themselves, so that prices appear to be determined, as a rule, by pure chance. As soon, therefore, as political economy stepped forth as a science, it was one of its first tasks to search for the law that hid itself behind this chance, which apparently determined the prices of commodities, and which in reality controlled this very chance. Among the prices of commodities, fluctuating and oscillating, now upward, now downward, the fixed central point was searched for around which these fluctuations and oscillations were taking place. In short, starting from the price of commodities, political economy sought for the value of commodities as the regulating law by means of which all price fluctuations could be explained and to which they could all be reduced in the last resort. And so, classical political economy found that the value of a commodity was determined by the labor incorporated in it and requisite to its production. With this explanation, it was satisfied, and we too may, for the present, stop at this point. But, to avoid misconceptions, I will remind the reader that today, this explanation has become wholly inadequate. Marx was the first to investigate thoroughly into the value-forming quality of labor and to discover that not all labor which is apparently or even really necessary to the production of a commodity, imparts under all circumstances to this commodity a magnitude of value corresponding to the quantity of labor used up. If, therefore, we say today in short, with economists like Ricardo, that the value of a commodity is determined by the labor necessary to its production, we always imply the reservations and restrictions made by Marx. Thus, much for our present purpose, Further information can be found in Marx's Critique of Political Economy, which appeared in 1859 and in the first volume of Capital. But, as soon as the economists applied this determination of value by labor to the commodity labor, they fell from one contradiction into another. How is the value of labor determined? By the necessary labor embodied in it. But how much labor is embodied in the labor of a laborer of a day, a week, a month, a year. If labor is the measure of all values, 
we can express the value of labor only in labor, but we know absolutely nothing about the value of an hour's labor, if all that we know about it is that it is equal to one hour's labor. So thereby, we have not advanced one hair's breadth nearer to our goal. We are constantly turning about in a circle. Classical economics, therefore, essayed another turn. It said, the value of a commodity is equal to its cost of production. But what is the cost of production of labor? In order to answer this question, the economists are forced to strain logic a little. Instead of investigating the cost of production of labor itself, which unfortunately cannot be ascertained, they now investigate the cost of production of the laborer. And this latter can be ascertained. It changes according to time and circumstances, but for a given condition of society, in a given locality, and in a given branch of production, it too is given, at least within quite narrow limits. We live today under the regime of capitalist production, under which a large and steadily growing class of the population can live only on the condition that it works for the owners of the means of production, tools, machines, raw materials, and means of subsistence, in return for wages. On the basis of this mode of production, the laborer's cost of production consists of the sum of the means of subsistence, or their price in money, which on the average are requisite to enable him to work, to maintain in him this capacity for work, and to replace him at his departure, by reason of age, sickness, or death, with another laborer, that is to say, to propagate the working class in required numbers. Let us assume that the money price of these means of subsistence averages three shillings a day. Our laborer gets, therefore, a daily wage of three shillings from his employer. For this, the capitalist lets him work, say, twelve hours a day. Our capitalist, moreover, calculates somewhat in the following fashion. Let us assume that our laborer, a machinist, has to make a part of a machine which he finishes in one day. The raw material, iron and brass in the necessary prepared form, costs twenty shillings. The consumption of coal by the steam engine, the wear and tear of this engine itself, of the turning lathe and of the other tools with which our laborer works, represent, for one day and one laborer, a value of one shilling. The wages for one day are, according to our assumption, three shillings. This makes a total of twenty-four shillings for our piece of a machine. But the capitalist calculates that, on an average, he will receive for it a price of twenty-seven shillings from his customers, or three shillings over and above his outlay. Whence do the three shillings pocketed by the capitalist come? According to the assertion of classical political economy, commodities are, in the long run, sold at their values. That is, they are sold at prices which correspond to the necessary quantities of labor contained in them. The average price of our part of a machine, 27 shillings, would therefore equal its value, i.e. equal the amount of labor embodied in it. But of these 27 shillings, 21 shillings were values already existing before the machinist began to work. 20 shillings were contained in the raw material, 1 shilling in the fuel consumed during the work and in the machines and tools used in the process and reduced in their efficiency to the value of this amount. There remains 6 shillings, which have been added to the value of the raw material. But according to the supposition of our economists themselves, these six shillings can arise only from the labor added to the raw material by the laborer. His twelve hours labor has created, according to this, a new value of six shillings. Therefore, the value of his twelve hours labor would be equivalent to six shillings. So we have at last discovered what the value of labor is. Hold on there, cries our machinist six shillings, but I've received only three shillings. My capitalist swears high and day that the value of my twelve hours' labor is no more than three shillings, and if I were to demand six, he'd laugh at me. What kind of a story is that? If, before this, we got with our value of labor into a vicious circle, we now surely have driven straight into an insoluble contradiction. We searched for the value of labor, and we found more than we can use. For the laborer, the value of the twelve hours' labor is three shillings. For the capitalist, it is six shillings, of which he pays the working man three shillings as wages and pockets the remaining three shillings himself. According to this, labor has not one but two values, and moreover, 
two very different values. As soon as we reduce the values, now expressed in money, in labor time, the contradiction becomes even more absurd. By the 12 hours labor, a new value of six shillings is created. Therefore, in six hours, the new value created equals three shillings, the amount which the laborer receives for 12 hours labor. For 12 hours labor, the working man receives, as an equivalent, the product of six hours labor. We are thus forced to one of two conclusions. Either labor has two values, one of which is twice as large as the other, or 12 equals 6. In both cases, we get pure absurdities. Turn and twist as we may, we will not get out of this contradiction as long as we speak of the buying and selling of labor and of the value of labor. And just so it happened to the political economists. The last offshoot of classical political economy, the Ricardian school, was largely wrecked on the insolubility of this contradiction. Classical political economy had run itself into a blind alley. A man who discovered the way out of this blind alley was Karl Marx. What the economists had considered as the cost of production of, quote, labor was really the cost of production, not of labor, but of the living laborer himself. And what this laborer sold to the capitalist was not his labor. Quote, so soon as his labor really begins, says Marx, it ceases to belong to him, and therefore can no longer be sold by him. Unquote. At the most, he could sell his future labor, i.e. assume the obligation of executing a certain piece of work in a certain time. But in this way, he does not sell labor, which would first have to be performed. But not for a stipulated payment, he places his labor power at the disposal of the capitalist for a certain time in case of time wages, or for the performance of a certain task, in case of peace wages. He hires out, or sells, his labor power. But this labor power has grown up with his person, and is inseparable from it. Its cost of production, therefore, coincides with his own cost of production. What the economist called the cost of production of labor is really the cost of production of the laborer, and therewith of his labor power. And thus, we can also go back from the cost of production of labor power to the value of labor power and determine the quantity of social labor that is required for the production of a labor power of a given quantity, as Marx has done in the chapter on the buying and selling of labor power, Capital Volume 1. Now, what takes place after the worker has sold his labor power, i.e., after he has placed his labor power at the disposal of the capitalist for stipulated wages? whether they are time wages or peace wages. The capitalist takes the laborer into his workshop or factory, where all the articles required for the work can be found, raw materials, auxiliary materials, like coal, dye stuffs, etc., tools, and machines. Here, the worker begins to work. His daily wages are, as above, three shillings, and it makes no difference whether he earns them as day wages or peace wages. We again assume that in 12 hours, the worker adds by his labor a new value of six shillings to the value of the raw materials consumed, which new value the capitalist realizes by the sale of the finished piece of work. Out of this new value, he pays the worker his three shillings and the remaining three shillings he keeps for himself. If now the laborer creates in 12 hours a value of six shillings, in six hours he creates a value of three shillings. Consequently, after working six hours for the capitalist, the laborer has returned to him the equivalent of the three shillings received as wages. After six hours' work, both are quits, neither one owing a penny to the other. Hold on there, now cries out the capitalist. I've hired the laborer for a whole day, for twelve hours, but six hours are only a half a day. So work along lively there, until the other six hours are at an end. Only then will we be even. And in fact, the laborer has to submit to the conditions of the contract upon which he entered of, quote, his own free will, and according to which he bound himself to work twelve whole hours for a product of labor which only cost six hours labor. Similarly with peace wages, let us suppose that in twelve hours our worker makes twelve commodities. Each of these costs a shilling in raw materials and wear and tear and is sold for 2.5 shillings. On our former assumption, the capitalist gives the laborer 0.25 of a shilling for each piece, which makes a total of three shillings for 12 pieces. To earn this, 
the worker requires 12 hours. The capitalist receives 30 shillings for the 12 pieces. Deducting 24 shillings for raw materials and wear and tear, there remains 6 shillings, of which he pays 3 shillings in wages, and pockets the remaining 3, just as before. Here also, the worker labors 6 hours for himself, i.e. to replace his wages, half an hour in each of the 12 hours, and 6 hours for the capitalist. The rock upon which the best economists were stranded, as long as they started out from the value of labor, vanishes as soon as we make our starting point the value of labor power. Labor power is, in our present-day capitalist society, a commodity like every other commodity, but yet a very peculiar commodity. It has, namely, the peculiarity of being a value-creating force, the source of value, and, moreover, when properly treated, the source of more value than it possesses itself. In the present state of production, human labor power not only produces in a day a greater value than it itself possesses in costs, but with each new scientific discovery, with each new technical invention, there also rises the surplus of its daily production over its daily cost, while as a consequence there diminishes that part of the working day in which the laborer produces the equivalent of his day's wages and, on the other hand, lengthens that part of the working day in which he must present labor gratis to the capitalist. And this is the economic constitution of our entire modern society. The working class alone produces all values, for value is only another expression for labor, that expression namely by which is designated in our capitalist society of today the amount of socially necessary labor embodied in a particular commodity. But, these values produced by the workers do not belong to the workers. They belong to the owners of the raw materials, machines, tools, and money, which enable them to buy the labor power of the working class. Hence, the working class gets back only a part of the entire mass of products produced by it. And, as we have just seen, the other portion, which the capitalist class retains, and which it has to share, at most, only with the landlord class, is increasing with every new invention and discovery, while the share which falls to the working class, per capita, rises but little and very slowly, or not at all, and under certain conditions it may even fall. But these discoveries and inventions which supplant one another with ever-increasing speed, this productiveness of human labor which increases from day to day to unheard-of proportions, at last gives rise to a conflict in which present capitalistic economy must go to ruin. On the one hand, immeasurable wealth and a superfluidity of products with which the buyers cannot cope. On the other hand, the great mass of society, proletarianized, transformed into wage laborers, and thereby disabled from appropriating to themselves that superfluidity of products. The splitting up of society into a small class, immoderately rich, and a large class of wage laborers devoid of all property, brings it about that this society smothers in its own superfluidity, while the great majority of its members are scarcely, or not at all, protected from extreme want. This condition becomes every day more absurd and more unnecessary. It must be gotten rid of. It can be gotten rid of. A new social order is possible, in which the class differences of today will have disappeared, and in which, perhaps after a short transition period which, though somewhat deficient in other respects, will in any case be very useful morally. There will be the means of life, of the enjoyment of life, and of the development and activity of all bodily and mental faculties, through the systematic use and further development of the enormous productive powers of society, which exists with us even now, with equal obligation upon all to work and that the workers are growing ever more determined to achieve this new social order will be proven on both sides of the ocean on this dawning May Day and on Sunday, May 3rd. Note, Engels is referring to the May Day celebrations of 1891. Signed, Frederick Engels, London, April 30, 1891. So that's the end of the introduction. Before we go on to the preliminary section, I just want to note um, you know, these concepts are very fundamental to Marx. The more of particularly later Marx that you read, the more that you see these things. But I think that every time that you go through them, something else just jumps out at you a little bit differently than did the last time that you read through it. On this reading, 
what stands out to me about the way that Engels was putting that uh, when he was talking about the worker has to work 12 hours, that's the agreement, uh, but six hours he's working for himself, in other words, to it's the necessary labor time to uh, basically generate enough value for his wages, and then the other six hours he's working for the capitalist. In a way, I think we're so numb to this concept, it just seems like, you know, such accomplished fact and indisputable at this point. But I mean, there really was a point in time where this wasn't necessarily the case. Like, this was a new order, and uh, people were really just newly coming to terms with it and struggling to analyze it. And really, the deal that is put out here by the capitalist in the case of you work six hours to pay for your own wages, basically, and then you work six hours just to pay the capitalist for really no good reason. I mean, honestly, what a strange agreement that is, you know, that the tools and raw materials that people need to make stuff to exchange in society, you know, just to pay for their own way in the world, for the reproduction of their organism, as was the subject of this introduction, basically, that you would just have to make this deal to work lots and lots of free hours for somebody else just so that you could access the machinery. And as Engels points out, the more that technology develops to leverage the productivity of labor into more and more goods and services with less and less labor, basically, the less time it takes for you to create enough value to pay yourself the wage, and then just, you know, an increasing share is being paid to the capitalist. And again, why? Just because the capitalist basically has monopoly of force, you know, private property laws that enforce his claim to the means of production. Yeah, we need to get rid of this. <laughs> and this is basically where we're coming from as Marxists, trying to end this deal where we just have to work to generate capitalists lots of free profit in exchange for working enough to produce stuff for us to live by. That's a really stupid deal, and uh, it doesn't need to be done, and it's tremendously inefficient, and lots of people are just working lots of hours for no other reason than to make a capitalist rich in order to have the privilege of using the workplaces we use to make the stuff that we need to live. Yeah, capitalists can indeed be taken out of that equation. Engels was right. A new social order is possible. It has been done, and we need to keep doing it until socialism covers the entire earth and capitalism has been completely stamped out of existence. Now, let's go on to Marx's portion, starting with the preliminary section. From various quarters, we have been reproached for neglecting to portray the economic conditions which form the material basis of the present struggles between classes and nations. With set purpose, we have hitherto touched upon these conditions only when they forced themselves upon the surface of the political conflicts. It was necessary, beyond everything else, to follow the development of the class struggle in the history of our own day, and to prove empirically, by the actual and daily newly created historical material, that with the subjugation of the working class, accomplished in the days of February and March, 1848, the opponents of that class the bourgeois republicans in France, and the bourgeois and peasant classes who were fighting feudal absolutism throughout the whole continent of Europe, were simultaneously conquered that the victory of the, quote, moderate republic in France sounded at the same time the fall of the nations which had responded to the February Revolution with heroic wars of independence. And finally, that by the victory over the revolutionary workingmen, Europe fell back into its old double slavery, into the English-Russian slavery. The June conflict in Paris, the fall of Vienna, the tragicomedy in Berlin in November 1848, the desperate efforts of Poland, Italy, and Hungary, the starvation of Ireland into submission. These were the chief events in which the European class struggle between the bourgeoisie and the working class was summed up, and from which we proved that every revolutionary uprising, however remote from the class struggle its object might appear, must of necessity fail until the revolutionary working class shall have conquered, that every social reform must remain a utopia until the proletarian revolution and the feudalistic counter-revolution have been pitted against each other in a worldwide war. 
in our presentation, as in reality, Belgium and Switzerland were tragicomic, caricaturish genre pictures in the great historic tableau. The one, the model state of the bourgeois monarchy, the other, the model state of the bourgeois republic. Both of them, states that flatter themselves to be just as free from the class struggle as from the European Revolution. But now, after our readers have seen the class struggle of the year 1848 develop into colossal political proportions, it is time to examine more closely the economic conditions themselves upon which is founded the existence of the capitalist class and its class rule, as well as the slavery of the workers. We shall present the subject in three great divisions. One, the relation of wage labor to capital, the slavery of the worker, the rule of the capitalist. Two, the inevitable ruin of the middle classes, petty bourgeois, and the so-called commons, peasants, under the present system. Three, the commercial subjugation and exploitation of the bourgeois classes of the various European nations by the despot of the world market, England. We shall seek to portray this as simply and popularly as possible, and shall not presuppose a knowledge of even the most elementary notions of political economy. We wish to be understood by the workers, and moreover, there prevails in Germany the most remarkable ignorance and confusion of ideas in regard to the simplest economic relations, from the patented defenders of existing conditions down to the socialist wonder workers and the unrecognized political geniuses, in which divided Germany is even richer than in duodecimo princelings. We therefore proceed to the consideration of the first problem. So, section one, what are wages? How are they determined? If several workmen were to be asked, how much wages do you get? One would reply, I get two shillings a day, and so on. According to the different branches of industry in which they are employed, they would mention different sums of money that they receive from their respective employers for the completion of a certain task. For example, for weaving a yard of linen or for setting a page of type. Despite the variety of their statements, they would all agree upon one point, that wages are the amount of money which the capitalist pays for a certain period of work or for a certain amount of work. Consequently, it appears that the capitalist buys their labor with money, and that for money they sell him their labor. But this is merely an illusion. What they actually sell to the capitalist for money is their labor power. This labor power the capitalist buys for a day, a week, a month, etc. And after he has bought it, he uses it up by letting the worker labor during the stipulated time. With the same amount of money with which the capitalist has bought their labor power, for example, with two shillings, he could have bought a certain amount of sugar or of any other commodity. The two shillings with which he bought 20 pounds of sugar is the price of 20 pounds of sugar. The two shillings with which he bought 12 hours use of labor power is the price of 12 hours labor. Labor power, then, is a commodity, no more, no less so, than is the sugar. The first is measured by the clock, the other by the scales. Their commodity, labor power, the workers exchange for the commodity of the capitalist, for money, and moreover, this exchange takes place at a certain ratio. So much money for so long a use of labor power. For twelve hours weaving, two shillings. And these two shillings, do they not represent all the other commodities which I can buy for two shillings? Therefore, actually, the worker has exchanged his commodity, labor power, for commodities of all kinds, and moreover, at a certain ratio. By giving him two shillings, the capitalist has given him so much meat, so much clothing, so much wood, light, etc., in exchange for his day's work. The two shillings, therefore, express the relation in which labor power is exchanged for other commodities, the exchange value of labor power. The exchange value of a commodity estimated in money is called its price. Wages, therefore, are only a special name for the price of labor power, and are usually called the price of labor. It is the special name for the price of this peculiar commodity, which has no other repository than human flesh and blood. Let us take any worker, for example a weaver. The capitalist supplies him with the loom and yarn. The weaver applies himself to work, and the yarn is turned into cloth. The capitalist takes possession of the cloth and sells it for 20 shillings, for example. Now, are the wages of the weaver a share of the cloth, of the 20 shillings, of the product of the work? By no means. Long before the cloth is sold, perhaps long before it's fully woven, the weaver has received his wages. 
The capitalist, then, does not pay his wages out of the money which he will obtain from the cloth, but out of money already on hand. Just as little as loom and yarn are the product of the weaver, to whom they are supplied by the employer, just so little are the commodities which he receives in exchange for his commodity, labor power, his product. It is possible that the employer found no purchasers at all for the cloth. It is possible that he did not get even the amount of the wages by its sale. It is possible that he sells it very profitably in proportion to the weaver's wages. But all that does not concern the weaver with a part of his existing wealth of his capital. The capitalist buys the labor power of the weaver in exactly the same manner as, with another part of his wealth, he's bought the raw material, the yarn, and the instrument of labor, the loom. After he has made these purchases, and among them belongs the labor power necessary to the production of the cloth he produces only with raw materials, and the instruments of labor belonging to him. For our good weaver, too, is one of the instruments of labor, and being in this respect on a par with the loom, he has no more share in the product, the cloth, or in the price of the product, than the loom itself has. Wages, therefore, are not a share of the worker in the commodities produced by himself. Wages are that part of already existing commodities with which the capitalist buys a certain amount of productive labor power. Consequently, labor power is a commodity which its possessor, the wage worker, sells to the capitalist. Why does he sell it? It is in order to live. But the putting of labor power into action, i.e. the work, is the active expression of the laborer's own life and this life activity he sells to another person in order to secure the necessary means of life. His life activity, therefore, is but a means of securing his own existence. He works that he may keep alive. He does not count the labor itself as a part of his life. It is rather a sacrifice of his life. It is a commodity that he has auctioned off to another. The product of his activity, therefore, is not the aim of his activity. What he produces for himself is not the silk that he weaves not the gold that he draws up the mining shaft, not the palace that he builds. What he produces for himself is wages, and the silk, the gold, and the palace are resolved for him into a certain quantity of necessaries of life, perhaps into a cotton jacket, into copper coins, and into a basement dwelling. And the laborer who for twelve hours long weaves, spins, bores, turns, builds, shovels, breaks stone, carries hods, and so on. Is this twelve hours weaving, spinning, boring, turning, building, shoveling, stone-breaking, regarded by him as a manifestation of life, as life? Quite the contrary. Life for him begins where this activity ceases, at the table, at the tavern, in bed. The twelve hours' work, on the other hand, has no meaning for him as weaving, spinning, boring, and so on, but only as earnings, which enable him to sit down at a table, to take his seat in the tavern, and to lie down in a bed. If the silkworm's object in spinning were to prolong its existence as caterpillar, it would be a perfect example of a wage worker. Labor power was not always a commodity, or merchandise. Labor was not always wage labor, i.e. free labor. The slave did not sell his labor power to the slave owner, any more than the ox sells his labor to the farmer. The slave, together with his labor power, was sold to his owner once and for all. He is a commodity that can pass from the hand of one owner to that of another. He himself is a commodity, but his labor power is not his commodity. The serf sells only a portion of his labor power. It is not he who receives wages from the owner of the land. Rather, it is the owner of the land who receives a tribute from him. The serf belongs to the soil, and to the lord of the soil he brings its fruit. The free laborer, on the other hand, sells his very self, and that by fractions. He auctions off eight, ten, twelve, fifteen hours of his life, one day like the next, to the highest bidder, to the owner of raw materials, tools, and the means of life, i.e. to the capitalist. The laborer belongs neither to an owner nor to the soil, but eight, ten, twelve, Fifteen hours of his daily life belong to whomsoever buys them. The worker leaves the capitalist, to whom he has sold himself, as often as he chooses, and the capitalist discharges him as often as he sees fit, as soon as he no longer gets any use, or not the required use, out of him. But the worker, whose only source of income is the sale of his labor power, 
cannot leave the whole class of buyers, i.e. the capitalist class, unless he gives up his own existence. He does not belong to this or that capitalist, but to the capitalist class, and it is for him to find his man, i.e. to find a buyer, in this capitalist class. Before entering more closely upon the relation of capital to wage labor, we shall present briefly the most general conditions which come into consideration in the determination of wages. Wages, as we have seen, are the price of a certain commodity, labor power. Wages, therefore, are determined by the same laws that determine the price of every other commodity. The question then is, how is the price of a commodity determined? And that's the end of this section. I think that that's fairly clear. The section is also fairly short, so if you need to listen to it again, you can. Basically, Marx is pointing out what is particular about the relationship of the worker to the capitalist in capitalism, as distinct from the relationship of a serf to a feudal lord, etc., and that in capitalism, workers belong to the capitalist class as a whole. It's the only place that workers can really sell their labor power. And of course, we as workers need to sell our labor power in order to get the wages that we need to buy the stuff that we need to live. All right, so the next section, by what is the price of a commodity determined? And remember here that Marx has pointed out in the first section already that labor power is really the only commodity that workers have to sell. Wages, of course, being the special name for the price of that commodity. So by asking by what is the price of a commodity determined, we can determine maybe the price of any commodity, including labor power, or in other words, how are wages determined. Although technically that's the next section, I think Marx splits those up into two chapters. But let's start with commodities in general. So, by what is the price of a commodity determined? By the competition between buyers and sellers, by the relation of the demand to the supply, of the call to the offer. The competition by which the price of a commodity is determined is threefold. The same commodity is offered for sale by various sellers. Whoever sells commodities of the same quality most cheaply is sure to drive the other sellers from the field and to secure the greatest market for himself. The sellers therefore fight among themselves for the sales, for the market. Each one of them wishes to sell and to sell as much as possible, and if possible to sell alone to the exclusion of all other sellers. Each one sells cheaper than the other. Thus, there takes place a competition among the sellers, which forces down the price of the commodities offered by them. But there is also a competition among the buyers. This, upon its side, causes the price of the proffered commodities to rise. Finally, there is competition between the buyers and the sellers. These wish to purchase as cheaply as possible, and those to sell as dearly or expensively as possible. The result of this competition between buyers and sellers will depend upon the relations between the two above-mentioned camps of competitors, i.e. upon whether the competition in the army of sellers is stronger. Industry leads two great armies into the field against each other, and each of these again is engaged in a battle among its own troops in its own ranks. The army among whose troops there is less fighting carries off the victory over the opposing host. Let us suppose that there are 100 bales of cotton in the market, and at the same time, purchasers for 1,000 bales of cotton. In this case, the demand is 10 times greater than the supply. Competition among the buyers, then, will be very strong. Each of them tries to get hold of one bale, if possible, of the whole 100 bales. This example is no arbitrary supposition. In the history of commerce, we have experienced periods of scarcity of cotton, when some capitalists united together and sought to buy up not 100 bales, but the whole cotton supply of the world. In the given case, then, one buyer seeks to drive the others from the field by offering a relatively higher price for the bales of cotton. The cotton sellers, who perceive the troops of the enemy in the most violent contention among themselves, and who therefore are fully assured of the sale of their whole 100 bales, will beware of pulling one another's hair in order to force down the price of cotton at the very moment in which their opponents race with each other to screw it up high. So, all of a sudden, peace reigns in the army of sellers. They stand opposed to the buyers like one man, fold their arms in philosophic contentment, and their claims would find no limit 
did not the offers of even the most importunate of buyers have a very definite limit. If, then, the supply of a commodity is less than the demand for it, competition among the sellers is very slight, or there may be none at all among them. In the same proportion in which this competition decreases, the competition among the buyers increases. Result, a more or less considerable rise in the prices of commodities. It is well known that the opposite case, with the opposite result, happens more frequently. Great excess of supply over demand, desperate competition among the sellers, and a lack of buyers, forced sales of commodities at ridiculously low prices. But what is a rise, and what a fall of prices? What is a high, and what a low price? A grain of sand is high when examined through a microscope, and a tower is low when compared with a mountain. And if the price is determined by the relation of supply and demand, by what is the relation of supply and demand determined? Let us turn to the first worthy citizen we meet. He will not hesitate one moment, but, like Alexander the Great, will cut this metaphysical knot with his multiplication table. He will say to us, If the production of the commodities which I sell has cost me a hundred pounds, and out of the sale of these goods I make one hundred ten pounds, within the year, you understand, that's an honest, sound, reasonable profit. But if in the exchange I receive 120 or 130 pounds, that's a higher profit. And if I should get as much as 200 pounds, that would be an extraordinary and enormous profit. What is it, then, that serves this citizen as the standard of his profit? The cost of the production of his commodities. If, in exchange for these goods, he receives a quantity of other goods whose production has cost less, he is lost. If he receives, in exchange for his goods, a quantity of other goods whose production has cost more, he has gained, and he reckons the falling or rising of the profit according to the degree at which the exchange value of his goods stands, whether above or below his zero, the cost of production. We have seen how the changing relation of supply and demand causes now a rise, now a fall of prices, now high, now low prices. If the price of a commodity rises considerably, owing to a falling supply, or a disproportionately growing demand, then the price of some other commodity must have fallen in proportion. For, of course, the price of a commodity only expresses in money the proportion in which other commodities will be given in exchange for it. If, for example, the price of a yard of silk rises from two to three shillings, the price of silver has fallen in relation to the silk, and in the same way the prices of all other commodities whose prices have remained stationary have fallen in relation to the price of silk. A large quantity of them must be given in exchange in order to obtain the same amount of silk. Now, what will be the consequence of a rise in the price of a particular commodity? a mass of capital will be thrown into the prosperous branch of industry, and this immigration of capital into the provinces of the favored industry will continue until it yields no more than the customary profits, or, rather, until the price of its products, owing to overproduction, sinks below the cost of production. Conversely, if the price of a commodity falls below its cost of production, then capital will be withdrawn from the production of this commodity. Except in the case of a branch of industry which has become obsolete and is therefore doomed to disappear, the production of such a commodity, that is, its supply, will, owing to this flight of capital, continue to decrease until it corresponds to the demand, and the price of the commodity rises again to the level of its cost of production, or rather, until the supply has fallen below the demand, and its price has risen above its cost of production or the current price of a commodity is always either above or below its cost of production. We see how capital continually emigrates out of the province of one industry and immigrates into that of another. The high price produces an excessive immigration, and the low price an excessive emigration. We could show, from another point of view, how not only the supply but also the demand is determined by the cost of production, but this would lead us too far away from our subject. We have just seen how the fluctuation of supply and demand always brings the price of a commodity back to its cost of production. The actual price of a commodity, indeed, stands always above or below the cost of production, 
but the rise and fall reciprocally balance each other so that within a certain period of time, if the ebbs and flows of the industry are reckoned up together, the commodities will be exchanged for one another in accordance with their cost of production. Their price is thus determined by their cost of production. The determination of price by the cost of production is not to be understood in the sense of the bourgeois economists. The economists say that the average price of commodities equals the cost of production. That is the law. The anarchic movement, in which the rise is compensated for by a fall and the fall for a rise, they regard as an accident. We might just as well consider the fluctuations as the law and the determination of the price by cost of production as an accident, as is, in fact, done by certain other economists. But it is precisely these fluctuations which, viewed more closely, carry the most frightful devastation in their train, and, like an earthquake, cause bourgeois society to shake to its very foundations. It is precisely these fluctuations that force the price to conform to the cost of production. In the totality of this disorderly movement is to be found its order. In the total course of this industrial anarchy, in this circular movement, competition balances, as it were, the one extravagance by the other. We thus see that the price of a commodity is indeed determined by its cost of production, but in such a manner that the periods in which the price of these commodities rises above the cost of production are balanced by the periods in which it sinks below the cost of production, and vice versa. Of course, this does not hold good for a single given product of an industry, but only for that branch of industry. So, also, it does not hold good for an individual manufacturer, but only for the whole class of manufacturers. The determination of price by cost of production is tantamount to the determination of price by the labor time requisite to the production of a commodity. For the cost of production consists, first of raw materials and wear and tear of tools, etc., i.e. of industrial products whose production has cost a certain number of workdays, which therefore represent a certain amount of labor time, and secondly, of direct labor, which is also measured by its duration. So that's the end of that section. Uh, Marx covered kind of a lot of ground in this section, so let's just go over it quickly before moving on to the next section. So he starts out by talking about the three factors that go into the determination of the price of a commodity. These are competition, or the lack thereof, between the sellers in a market, the competition, or the lack thereof, between buyers in a market, and then the competition between the buyers and sellers in a market. Marx describes how if there is a lot of competition among the buyers, then the sellers can basically charge what they want. And conversely, if there's not much competition among the buyers, i.e. there isn't that much demand, then the sellers are competing with each other, trying to lower the price because they want to sell for something. And then ultimately, the relationship between the buyers and the sellers, which is where the actual sale or transaction takes place, is kind of a function of the previous two, or at least that sets the stage for it. So then Marx makes another point. He says, well, in this whole, you know, competition between buyers and sellers, the prices may be going up or may be going down, but what is the frame of reference? And the frame of reference is the cost of production. How much did it cost the capitalist to produce the commodity versus how much can the capitalist get for the commodity in a sale to a buyer? In other words, will they make a net profit or will they have a net loss? And in either case, how much will they gain or how much will they lose at a particular price related to whatever it costs to produce? Marx then talks about how if you're a capitalist and you have capitalists to invest in a factory and setting up an operation, you of course are going to gravitate towards producing those commodities which are going to realize more profit. However, what is going to produce more profit is always in flux. Why? Because the cost of production may change, the amount of competition between other makers of the same commodity will be changing, the amount of demand might be changing. So, in other words, there are always these fluctuations in the actual price that something's sold for, and these depend on the fluctuations in the supply and the demand, but that over time, the actual price always averages out to the cost of production. Sometimes it's above, sometimes it's below. Over time, though, it averages out to that cost of production. But again, remember that the actual price 
is always changing. It's always going up and down. And Marx makes the point that as the price goes up and down, it throws bourgeois society into crises and boom periods, fluctuating on and off. Marx then closes by recapping, quote, the determination of price by cost of production is tantamount to the determination of price by the labor time requisite to the production of a commodity. For the cost of production consists first of raw materials and wear and tear of tools, etc., i.e. of industrial products whose production has cost a certain number of work days, which therefore represent a certain amount of labor time. So commenting basically the first part here of the cost of production of a commodity is the cost of production of the raw materials and the cost of production of the tools and the wear and tear costs of all the industrial products that go into the production, which, of course, we can measure in terms of the amount of labor time that was put into the creation of the raw materials and tools and all that stuff. And then secondly, of the direct labor, which was applied to those raw materials and the tools, etc., to produce whatever the final commodity is, which is being produced here. So in sum, if you're trying to figure out the price by cost of production of, let's say, commodity X, then you look at the raw materials A, B, C, and D that were used to make it, whatever the raw materials were, and the tools E, F, and G. You look at the labor time required to produce all of those things, A through G, and then the labor time applied to A through G to create Z. Hopefully that's clear. If not, go back and listen again. Maybe it will be. And if it is, let's go on to section three. By what are wages determined? Now, the same general laws which regulate the price of commodities in general naturally regulate wages, or the price of labor power. Wages will now rise, now fall, according to the relation of supply and demand, according as competition shapes itself between the buyers of labor power, the capitalists, and the sellers of labor power, the workers. The fluctuations of wages correspond to the fluctuation in the price of commodities in general, but within the limits of these fluctuations, the price of labor power will be determined by the cost of production, by the labor time necessary for production of this commodity, labor power. What, then, is the cost of production of labor power? It is the cost required for the maintenance of the laborer as a laborer, and for his education and training as a laborer. Therefore, the shorter the time required for training up to a particular sort of work, the smaller is the cost of production of the worker, the lower is the price of his labor power, his wages. In those branches of industry in which hardly any period of apprenticeship is necessary, and the mere bodily existence of the worker is sufficient, the cost of his production is limited almost exclusively to the commodities necessary for keeping him in working condition. The price of his work will therefore be determined by the price of the necessary means of subsistence. Here, however, there enters another consideration. The manufacturer who calculates his cost of production, and in accordance with it, the price of the product, takes into account the wear and tear of the instruments of labor. If a machine costs him, for example, 1,000 shillings, and this machine is used up in 10 years, he adds 100 shillings annually to the price of the commodities, in order to be able, after 10 years, to replace the worn-out machine with a new one. In the same manner, the cost of production of simple labor power must include the cost of propagation, by means of which the race of workers is enabled to multiply itself and to replace worn-out workers with new ones. The wear and tear of the worker, therefore, is calculated in the same manner as the wear and tear of the machine. Thus, the cost of production of simple labor power amounts to the cost of the existence and propagation of the worker. The price of this cost of existence and propagation constitutes wages. The wages thus determined are called the minimum of wages. This minimum wage, like the determination of the price of commodities in general by cost of production, does not hold good for the single individual, but only for the race. Individual workers, indeed millions of workers, do not receive enough to be able to exist and to propagate themselves, but the wages of the whole working class adjust themselves within the limits of their fluctuations, to this minimum. Now that we have come to an understanding in regard to the most general laws which govern wages, as well as the price of every other commodity, 
we can examine our subject more particularly. That's the end of that section. I think that that was fairly clear. So basically, we've already established that wages is just a special name, basically, for the price of labor power, a commodity, the only commodity, really, that workers have to sell, and that these wages, like any price, are determined by the average cost of production, which, for a human being, which is where labor power lives, means the cost of existence, feeding, clothing, sheltering yourself, and all that kind of stuff, any education that you might need, which, again, as Marx points out, is going to vary depending on the type of work that you're expected to do, and of propagation. So what does that mean? Reproduction, child rearing, family formation. So that's where we get wages from. Again, wages being another fancy name for the price of labor power. So the next two sections are about capital. The first is the nature and growth of capital, and then the relation of wage labor to capital. Let's start with the nature and growth of capital. Capital consists of raw materials, instruments of labor, and means of subsistence of all kinds, which are employed in producing new raw materials, new instruments, and new means of subsistence. All these components of capital are created by labor, products of labor, accumulated labor. Accumulated labor that serves as a means to new production is capital. So say the economists. What is a Negro slave, a man of the black race? Comment, Note that Marx was writing this originally in the 1840s, prior to the U.S. Civil War. However, it's worth noting also that the British Empire officially forbade slavery in 1833, making it significantly more progressive on this issue than the United States. That said, of course, the British Empire, also guilty of innumerable other atrocities, just not that particular one, continuing, the one explanation is worthy of the other. A Negro is a Negro. Only under certain conditions does he become a slave. A cotton spinning machine is a machine for spinning cotton. Only under certain conditions does it become capital. Torn away from these conditions, it is as little capital as gold is itself money, or sugar is the price of sugar. In the process of production, human beings work not only upon nature, but also upon one another. They produce only by working together in a specified manner and reciprocally exchanging their activities. In order to produce, they enter into definite connections and relations to one another, and only within these social connections and relations does their influence upon nature operate, i.e., does production take place. These social relations between the producers and the conditions under which they exchange their activities and share in the total act of production will naturally vary according to the character of the means of production. With the discovery of a new instrument of warfare, the firearm, the whole internal organization of the army was necessarily altered, the relations within which individuals compose an army and can work as an army were transformed, and the relation of different armies to another was likewise changed. We thus see that the social relations within which individuals produce, the social relations of production, are altered, transformed, with the change and development of the material means of production, of the forces of production. The relations of production in their totality constitute what is called the social relations, society, and, moreover, a society at a definite stage of historical development, a society with peculiar, distinctive characteristics. Ancient society, feudal society, bourgeois or capitalist society, are such totalities of relations of production, each of which denotes a particular stage of development in the history of mankind. Capital is also a social relation of production. It is a bourgeois relation of production, a relation of production of bourgeois society. The means of subsistence, the instruments of labor, the raw materials of which capital consists, have they not been produced and accumulated under given social conditions within definite special relations? Are they not employed for new production, under given special conditions, within definite social relations? And does not just the definite social character stamp the products which serve for new production as capital? Capital consists not only of means of subsistence, instruments of labor, and raw materials, not only as material products, it consists just as much of exchange values. 
all products of which it consists are commodities. Capital, consequently, is not only a sum of material products, it is a sum of commodities, of exchange values, of social magnitudes. Capital remains the same whether we put cotton in the place of wool, rice in the place of wheat, steamships in the place of railroads, provided only that the cotton, the rice, the steamships, the body of capital, have the same exchange value, the same price, as the wool, the wheat, the railroads, in which it was previously embodied. The bodily form of capital may transform itself continually, while capital does not suffer the least alteration. But though every capital is a sum of commodities, i.e. of exchange values, it does not follow that every sum of commodities, of exchange values, is capital. So quick comment here, Marx is about to go into exchange values a little bit more. If you maybe have read parts of capital before, basically there are two kind of key things, a use value and an exchange value, key concepts here. A use value is a thing that humans can put to use. So like, for example, a shovel, you know, a piece of wood with some metal stuck on the end. It's something you can use to dig dirt and related other tasks. It also can be exchanged. And a capitalist, let's say, who was opening a hardware store would stockpile a bunch of shovels and other use values, pickaxes and whatever other kind of tools they're going to have at the hardware store. So you have them, but they're not really there for your use. They're there primarily for the capitalist as exchange values. I'm going to leave it there for now. There is more to this topic, which is explained in greater detail elsewhere. Like I said, Marx is going to go into exchange values a little bit more. So continuing. Every sum of exchange values is an exchange value. Each particular exchange value is a sum of exchange values. For example, a house worth a thousand pounds is an exchange value of a thousand pounds. A piece of paper worth one penny is a sum of exchange values of one hundred one one hundredths of a penny. Products which are exchangeable for others are commodities. The definite proportion in which they are exchangeable forms their exchange value, or, expressed in money, their price. I'm going to say that again. Products which are exchangeable for others are commodities. The definite proportion in which they are exchangeable forms their exchange value, or, when it's expressed in money, it's called their price. Continuing. The quantity of these products can have no effect on their character as commodities, as representing an exchange value, as having a certain price. Whether a tree be large or small, it remains a tree. Whether we exchange iron in penny weights or in hundred weights for other products, does this alter its character, its being a commodity or exchange value? According to the quantity, it is a commodity of greater or of lesser value, of higher or of lower price. How then does a sum of commodities, of exchange values, become capital? Thereby, that as an independent social power, i.e. as the power of a part of society, it preserves itself and multiplies by exchange with direct living labor power. I'm going to read that again. How then does a sum of commodities, of exchange values, become capital? Thereby, that as an independent social power, i.e. as the power of a part of society, it preserves itself and multiplies by exchange with direct living labor power. The existence of a class which possesses nothing but the ability to work is a necessary presupposition of capital. It is only the dominion of past, accumulated, materialized labor over immediate living labor that stamps the accumulated labor with the character of capital. Capital does not consist in the fact that accumulated labor serves living labor as a means for new production. It consists in the fact that living labor serves accumulated labor as the means of preserving and multiplying its exchange value. So, that's the end of that section. We're going to recap. That last section in particular, I think, may have been a little bit abstract. So, let's read that again. It is only the dominion of past accumulated, materialized labor over immediate living labor that stamps the accumulated labor with the character of capital. So Marx is saying in that sentence that capital is past accumulated materialized labor. 
And this dominates immediate living labor going on. Capital does not consist in the fact that accumulated labor serves living labor as a means for new production. It consists in the fact that living labor serves accumulated labor as the means of preserving and multiplying its exchange value. So in other words, in this social relationship that Marx is describing, capital dominates labor, and labor exists to serve capital as a means of preserving and multiplying its exchange value. Not a great deal for labor, if you ask me. So let's recap from the beginning. Marx opens with basically a definition of capital, which, if you're not reading carefully, you might mistake as the definition. In fact, Marx concludes this by saying, so say the economists. In other words, the bourgeois economists that are all good with capitalism, this is their understanding of it. And basically the definition said by the economists that Marx is citing is, accumulated labor that serves as a means to new production is capital. What do we mean by accumulated labor? Well, you labor and then you create a product which is the embodiment or accumulation of your labor. So basically products of labor which serve as a means to new production, that's capital, at least according to the bourgeois economists. However, over the course of this chapter, Marx is going to give new insights, ending by saying capital does not consist in, or its essence is not, the fact that accumulated labor serves living labor as a means for new production, as the bourgeois economists say. So that's not basically the main thing. He says it consists in the fact that living labor serves accumulated labor as the means of preserving and multiplying its exchange value. So how do we get from the bourgeois definition to Marx's proletarian or socialist definition giving the insights basically of the working class into capital. So Marx starts with two examples. One is a black man. The other is a cotton spinning machine. And he says that a black man is a black man. End of story in and of itself. Likewise, a cotton spinning machine is a cotton spinning machine in and of itself. End of story. But under certain conditions, each becomes something else, or I guess you could say takes on a social meaning, takes on a meaning within a certain set of social conditions. Marx then goes on to describe how the act of production, the process of production, which is important because we need to produce things just to survive, therefore we're always producing things, this is shaped by the technology that we use. And he gives the example there of warfare becomes shaped by new weapons. And specifically, what about warfare? The way in which armies are organized, basically how people participate in warfare, how we form social organizations for the purpose of warfare. Well, if you're fighting with crossbows, it may imply certain facts about the way that you need to organize yourself to your advantage. And if rifles become introduced at a later stage of technology, then it may imply different things about the way that the army needs to organize itself for you know, advantageous engagement in warfare. Well, the same thing with production. Industrial technology is going to change the processes of production, and therefore society will reform in particular ways around it to use that technology. Marx calls these social formations the relations of production. He says, we thus see that the social relations within which individuals produce, the social relations of production, are altered, transformed with the change and development of the material means of production, of the forces of production, in other words, that technology. The relations of production in their totality constitute what is called the social relations, society, and moreover, a society at a definite stage of historical development. So within Marxism, you have basically described different phases or modes of production. There's socialism, there's capitalism, there's feudalism, there are slave states and other things going back to earlier points in development. All of which, as Marx says, 
describe a society at a definite stage of historical development. And all of these have peculiar, distinctive characteristics. So then Marx starts describing capitalism and capital, starting with the bourgeois definition of capital, which is products of labor or accumulated labor, which is then used in new production. In other words, the old products of labor are carried forward into new productive processes to engage in new production. So for example, you want to start a bakery. All right, going real minimal here, you need an oven, you need at least a table, you need flour, water, salt, sugar, whatever you're starting with. And where did these things come from? Did they just materialize out of the sky? No, the flour is the product of somebody else's labor, probably a whole operation. Where did the oven come from? Well, somebody made it. So, capital, products of labor, used in a new production process. Whoever made the oven was not engaging in baking, they were engaging in oven making. But you then take the oven and you engage that in the process of bread making or cakes or whatever you're going to make at your bakery. So Marx makes the point that all that stuff, which is capital, is commodities. But not all commodities are capital. Well, what's the difference? What makes a commodity capital or not capital? Again, if you ask the bourgeois economists, they just say, well, you're using it in the new process of production. For Marx, that's not good enough. He asks, if capital is this thing, it's a sum of commodities, or in other words, of exchange values, which we know are interchangeable with any other exchange values of equal value. And a key thing here in their becoming capital is that they're being used in the production process. What does this imply? So let's read that ending again. Thereby, that as an independent social power, i.e. as the power of a part of society, it preserves itself, capital that is, and multiplies by exchange with direct living labor power. The existence of a class which possesses nothing but the ability to work is a necessary presupposition of capital. It is only the dominion of past accumulated materialized labor over immediate living labor that stamps the accumulated labor with the character of capital. And then he summarizes again by closing with, capital does not consist in the fact that accumulated labor serves living labor as a means for new production. It consists in the fact that living labor serves accumulated labor as the means of preserving and multiplying its exchange value. So, in my honest opinion, I think that this could be put more clearly. In other words, I think that the way that it's written here, it, the meaning doesn't really leap off the page, at least in my opinion. For example, Marx makes the statement, the existence of a class which possesses nothing but the ability to work is a necessary presupposition of capital. So, we have basically Marx describing here this thing, capital, which is sort of apart from and also dominating the lives of direct living labor power. In fact, as Marx says, preserving itself and multiplying itself by exchange with direct living labor power. In other words, when capital comes into contact with direct living labor power, it has the effect of preserving and multiplying capital as this power of a part of society, which grows and grows, and labor is just basically there to serve it and make sure that it keeps growing and growing. Again, I think that the meaning comes across, but maybe this isn't the most lucid statement of these principles. Anyway, I think I've milked this one for every last drop. What do you think? Leave a comment below. We're going to move on, though, to the next section, the relation of wage labor to capital. What is it that takes place in the exchange between the capitalist and the wage laborer? The laborer receives means of subsistence in exchange for his labor power. The capitalist receives in exchange for his means of subsistence, labor, the productive activity of the laborer, the creative force by which the worker not only replaces what he consumes, but also gives to the accumulated labor a greater value than it previously possessed. The laborer gets from the capitalist a portion of the existing means of subsistence. For what purpose do these means of subsistence serve him? For immediate consumption. But as soon as I consume these means of subsistence, they are irrevocably lost to me unless I employ the time 
during which these means sustain my life, in producing new means of subsistence, in creating by my labor new values in place of the values lost in consumption. But it is just this noble reproductive power that the laborer surrenders to the capitalist in exchange for means of subsistence received. Consequently, he has lost it for himself. Let us take an example. For one shilling, a laborer works all day long in the fields of a farmer, to whom he thus secures a return of two shillings. The farmer not only receives the replaced value, which he has given to the day laborer, he has doubled it. Therefore, he has consumed the one shilling that he gave to the day laborer in a fruitful, productive manner. For the one shilling, he has bought the labor power of the day laborer, which creates products of the soil of twice the value, and out of one shilling makes two. The day laborer, on the contrary, receives in the place of his productive force, whose results he has just surrendered to the farmer, one shilling, which he exchanges for means of subsistence, which he consumes more or less quickly. The one shilling has therefore been consumed in a double manner, reproductively for the capitalist, for it has been exchanged for labor power, which brought forth two shillings, unproductively for the worker, for it has been exchanged for means of subsistence which are lost forever, and whose value he can obtain again only by repeating the same exchange with the farmer. Capital therefore presupposes wage labor. Wage labor presupposes capital. They condition each other, each brings the other into existence. So commenting quickly, I think that this is what Marx was getting at at the end of the last section. He stated it but didn't make the case for it. Now he's making the case for it. Continuing. Does a worker in a cotton factory produce only cotton? No. He produces capital. He produces values which serve anew to command his work and to create by means of it new values. Capital can multiply itself only by exchanging itself for labor power, by calling wage labor into life. The labor power of the wage laborer can exchange itself for capital only by increasing capital, by strengthening that very power whose slave it is. Increase of capital, therefore, is increase of the proletariat, i.e. of the working class. And so, the bourgeoisie and its economists maintain that the interest of the capitalist and of the laborer is the same. And in fact, so they are. The worker perishes if capital does not keep him busy. Capital perishes if it does not exploit labor power, which, in order to exploit, it must buy. The more quickly the capital destined for production, the productive capital, increases, the more prosperous industry is, the more the bourgeoisie enriches itself, the better business gets. So many more workers does the capitalist need, so much dearer, more expensive, does the worker sell himself. The fastest possible growth of productive capital is, therefore, the indispensable condition for a tolerable life to the laborer. But what is growth of productive capital? Growth of the power of accumulated labor over living labor. Growth of the rule of the bourgeoisie over the working class. When wage labor produces the alien wealth dominating it, the power hostile to it, capital, there flow back to it its means of employment, i.e. its means of subsistence, under the condition that it again become a part of capital, that is, to become again the lever whereby capital is to be forced into an accelerated, expansive movement. To say that the interests of capital and the interests of the workers are identical signifies only this, that capital and wage labor are two sides of one and the same relation. The one conditions the other in the same way that the usurer and the borrower condition each other. As long as the wage laborer remains a wage laborer, his lot is dependent upon capital. That is what the boasted community of interests between workers and capitalists amounts to. If capital grows, the mass of wage labor grows. The number of wage workers increases. In a word, the sway of capital extends over a greater mass of individuals. Let us suppose the most favorable case. If productive capital grows, the demand for labor grows. It therefore increases the price of labor power, wages. A house may be large or small. As long as the neighboring houses are likewise small, it satisfies all social requirement for a residence. But let there arise next to the little house a palace, and the little house shrinks to a hut. 
The little house now makes it clear that its inmate has no social position at all to maintain, or but a very insignificant one. And however high it may shoot up in the course of civilization, if the neighboring palace rises in equal or even in greater measure, the occupant of the relatively little house will always find himself more uncomfortable, more dissatisfied, more cramped within his four walls. An appreciable rise in wages presupposes a rapid growth of productive capital. Rapid growth of productive capital calls forth just as rapid a growth of wealth, of luxury, of social needs and social pleasures. Therefore, although the pleasures of the laborer have increased, the social gratification which they afford has fallen in comparison with the increased pleasures of the capitalist, which are inaccessible to the worker, in comparison with the stage of development of society in general. Our wants and pleasures have their origin in society. We therefore measure them in relation to society. We do not measure them in relation to the objects which serve for their gratification. Since they are of a social nature, they are of a relative nature. But wages are not at all determined merely by the sum of commodities for which they may be exchanged. Other factors enter into the problem. What the workers directly receive for their labor power is a certain sum of money. Are wages determined merely by this money price? In the 16th century, the gold and silver circulation in Europe increased in consequence of the discovery of richer and more easily worked mines in America. The value of gold and silver, therefore, fell in relation to other commodities. The workers received the same amount of coined silver for their labor power as before. The money price of their work remained the same, and yet their wages had fallen, for in exchange for the same amount of silver, they obtained a smaller amount of other commodities. This was one of the consequences which furthered the growth of capital, the rise of the bourgeoisie in the 18th century. Let us take another case. In the winter of 1847, in consequence of bad harvest, the most indispensable means of subsistence, grains, meat, butter, cheese, etc., rose greatly in price. Let us suppose that the workers still received the same sum of money for their labor powers before. Did not their wages fall? To be sure, for the same money they received in exchange, less bread, meat, etc. Their wages fell, not because the value of silver was less, but because the value of the means of subsistence had increased. Finally, let us suppose that the money price of labor power remained the same, while all agricultural, and manufactured commodities had fallen in price because of the employment of new machines, of favorable seasons, etc. For the same money, the workers could now buy more commodities of all kinds. Their wages have therefore risen just because their money value has not changed. The money price of labor power, the nominal wages, do not therefore coincide with the actual or real wages, i.e., with the amount of commodities which are actually given in exchange for the wages. If we then speak of a rise or fall of wages, we have to keep in mind not only the money price of labor power, the nominal wages, but also the real wages. But neither the nominal wages, i.e. the amount of money for which the laborer sells himself to the capitalist, nor the real wages, i.e. the amount of commodities which he can buy for this money, exhausts the relations which are comprehended in the term wages. Wages are determined above all by their relations to the gain or the profit of the capitalist. In other words, wages are a proportionate relative quantity. Real wages express the price of labor power in relation to the price of commodities. Relative wages, on the other hand, express the share of immediate labor in the value newly created by it, in relation to the share of it which falls to accumulated labor to capital. That's the end of that section. The next section is called the general law that determines the rise and fall of wages and profits. So clearly Marx is about to expand on this. Before we go on, let's just recap the section, make sure everybody's on the same page and caught everything. There are a number of somewhat disparate concepts within this topic. So starting out, Marx talks about the relationship between the laborer and the capitalist and how basically both are bringing something to the table here. The laborer exchanges labor power, the capitalist exchanges wages. But Marx highlights how the laborer is basically just getting subsistence. He's not really getting more than he came out with. He's just sort of changing the form, 
taking labor power, turning it into subsistence. The capitalist, on the other hand, is actually getting more than he started out with, at least as long as the business is successful. Although not looking at one business in particular, overall the capitalist class and all of its many enterprises, they certainly do, over time, accumulate capital and grow, even if particular businesses or even industries you know, have rises and falls. But basically the setup here is that the laborer is subsisting while the capitalist's wealth is growing. And that is just the way the logic of this system goes, as Marx just explained. This is basic to capitalism. So what happens over time? Capital grows and grows, and it needs more laborers to keep multiplying this wealth, because that's the deal. How do people subsist? You go and multiply some capital, and then that allows you to subsist. That's the basic deal of capitalism. You must multiply capital in order to subsist. Those are the terms of getting in the door to a capitalist enterprise and having them let you operate the means of production. So over time, capital grows and grows. More and more people become proletarianized. It's just a process. This is just what happens. There's really no going back, although that doesn't stop certain reactionaries from, as we say, trying to turn back the wheel of history. But there is no turning it back, and this drive either comes out of ignorance of these processes or just denial, and, well, we're going to try it anyway. And you can get movements such as fascism out of this process, but that's a, another discussion. What we as socialists say is that the best thing for the proletariat, this newly created large class of dispossessed workers, merely abolish private property and then operate the means of production in common so you know, thereby we break this deal of just multiplying capital to subsist, and that capital remains in private hands. So Marx then goes on to consider, all right, well, what if everything's going smoothly, and there's great demand for laborers, and the capitalists are paying high wages, high prices of labor power, high wages? Well, then he considers that how satisfied workers will be, I mean, people in general, will be with what they can get with their wages, you know, you start out with a house, and it might be small, but it meets your needs, and everybody around you has houses. But then, in comparison to somebody else having something big, because our satisfaction in these ways is social, then that creates a dissonance. The just existence of the capitalist becomes a thorn in the side of all the workers who see the things that the capitalist has, and this changes how the workers feel about the things that they have. So, as Marx says, quote, Therefore, although the pleasures of the laborer have increased, like you can buy more stuff because you're getting paid well, the social gratification which they afford has fallen in comparison with the increased pleasures of the capitalist, which are inaccessible to the worker, in comparison with the stage of development in society in general, like the technology that's out, the kinds of luxuries that are available. Our wants and pleasures have their origin in society, like kind of what we're doing all this for. We therefore measure them in relation to society. We do not measure them in relation to the objects which serve for their gratification. Since they are of a social nature, they are of a relative nature. In other words, all the things that you have, you don't just have them in a vacuum. You have them in the society in which you exist. And you use them in your relationship with other people, to some extent in your relationship with yourself, and that is the background for your experience of all the stuff that you have. So with that out of the way, Marx then goes on to a couple of closing concepts. Nominal wages, which is the actual number that's on your paycheck. Then there's real wages, which is how much those numbers can actually get you in terms of food and shelter and clothing and recreational toys and whatever else. And that depends on the relation of the price of labor power to the price of all those other commodities that you'd be exchanging your wages for. And then lastly, there are what Marx calls relative wages, which is the relationship or the proportion between the wages that the workers are paid and the wealth that their labor produced or how much richer the capitalist gets. In other words, in the opening example, Marx says that, oh, the capitalist pays the worker one shilling. The worker then does work that produces two shillings worth of value and so basically the wages are half the value that they produced. 
But that relationship or that ratio, that proportion, could be anything. Could be 2 to 1, could be 5 to 1, could be 300 to 1. So again, nominal wages, the amount that's on your paycheck. Real wages, the amount of stuff you can get for whatever your paycheck was. And relative wages, the amount on your paycheck in comparison to how much capital your work produced. All right, recap over, let's go on to the next section, the general law that determines the rise and fall of wages and profits. We have said, wages are not a share of the worker in the commodities produced by him. Wages are that part of already existing commodities with which the capitalist buys a certain amount of productive labor power. But the capitalist must replace these wages out of the price for which he sells the product made by the worker. He must so replace it that, as a rule, there remains to him a surplus above the cost of production expended by him. That is, he must get a profit. The selling price of the commodities produced by the worker is divided, from the point of view of the capitalist, into three parts. First, the replacement of the price of the raw materials advanced by him, in addition to the replacement of the wear and tear of the tools, machines, and other instruments of labor likewise advanced by him. Second, the replacement of the wages advanced, and third, the surplus leftover, i.e. the profit of the capitalist. While the first part merely replaces previously existing values, it is evident that the replacement of the wages and the surplus, or the profit, of capital are as a whole taken out of the new value, which is produced by the labor of the worker and added to the raw materials. And in this sense, we can view wages as well as profit for the purpose of comparing them with each other as shares in the product of the worker. Real wages may remain the same. They may even rise. Nevertheless, the relative wages may fall. Comment. So again, real wages, the actual dollar amount per hour. Relative wages is the relationship of that dollar amount to the profit of the capitalist. Continuing. Let us suppose, for instance, that all means of subsistence have fallen two-thirds in price, while the day's wages have fallen but one-third, for example, from three to two shillings. Although the worker can now get a greater amount of commodities with these two shillings than he formerly did with three shillings, yet his wages have decreased in proportion to the gain of the capitalist. The profit of the capitalist, the manufacturers, for instance, has increased one shilling, which means that for a smaller amount of exchange values, which he pays to the worker, the latter must produce a greater amount of exchange values than before. Comment. So before we go on, I'm going to just kind of try to illustrate this example a little bit more clearly in case anybody's having trouble. So Mark says that in this example, the means of subsistence have fallen two-thirds in price. So what does that mean? It means that something that used to cost 30 cents now costs 10 cents and the wages have fallen by a third. That means that everybody who used to get paid a dollar now gets 67 cents. So the good news for the worker is that although the amount on the paycheck dropped, you can actually get double the stuff that you used to, right? Because let's say a meal cost 30 cents and you were getting paid a dollar. Well, you could basically buy three meals and have a little left over with your day's wages. Now, even though you're getting paid less, 67 cents. Meals are 10 cents, so you can get six of them with your day's wages. Great. What's different, though? The capitalist kept the 33 cents by which your paycheck dropped. Like, it didn't just vanish into the atmosphere. The capitalist kept it. So let's say that before, your share was a dollar, and again, that dropped to 67 cents, and the capitalist's previous share was $2. Well, now it's 233. So that changes the ratio from 1 to 2, worker to capitalist, to 2 to 7, basically in between a third and a quarter. Or let's even say that it did get lost in the atmosphere somewhere. I don't know. The capitalist, uh, you know, it fell between some cracks and it's gone. 67 cents to 2 is still a different ratio than 1 to 2. It's actually a third. So what does this mean? Let's go back to Marx, continuing. The share of capital in proportion to the share of labor, has risen. The distribution of social wealth between capital and labor has become still more unequal than it was before. The capitalist commands a greater amount of labor with the same amount of capital. 
The power of the capitalist class over the working class has grown. The social position of the worker has become worse, has been forced down still another degree below that of the capitalist compared to what it was before. What then is the general law that determines the rise and fall of wages and profit in their reciprocal relation? They stand in inverse proportion to each other. The share of capital, aka profit, increases in the same proportion in which the share of labor, aka wages, falls, and vice versa. Profit rises in the same degree in which wages fall. Profit falls in the same degree in which wages rise. It might be argued, perhaps, that the capitalist class can gain by an advantageous exchange of his products with other capitalists, by a rise in the demand for his commodities, whether in consequence of the opening up of new markets, or in consequence of temporarily increased demands in the old market, and so on, that the profit of the capitalist therefore may be multiplied by taking advantage of other capitalists, independently of the rise and fall of wages, of the exchange value of labor power, or that the profit of the capitalist may also rise through improvements in the instruments of labor, new applications of the forces of nature, and so on. But in the first place it must be admitted that the result remains the same, although brought about in an opposite manner. Profit, indeed, has not risen because wages have fallen, but wages have fallen because profit has risen. With the same amount of another man's labor, the capitalist has bought a larger amount of exchange values, without having paid more for the labor on that account, i.e., the work is paid for less in proportion to the net gain which it yields to the capitalist. In the second place, it must be borne in mind that, despite the fluctuations in the prices of commodities, the average price of every commodity, the proportion in which it exchanges for other commodities, is determined by its cost of production. The acts of overreaching and taking advantage of one another within the capitalist ranks necessarily equalize themselves. The improvements of machinery, the new applications of the forces of nature in the service of production, make it possible to produce, in a given amount of time, with the same amount of labor and capital, a larger amount of products, but in no wise a larger amount of exchange values. If, by the use of the spinning machine, I can furnish twice as much yarn in an hour as before its invention, for instance, 100 pounds instead of 50 pounds, in the long run, I receive back, in exchange for this 100 pounds, no more commodities than I did before for 50, because the cost of production has fallen by one half, or because I can furnish double the product at the same cost. So commenting, Marx is calling back there from an earlier part that the average price of every commodity is determined by its cost of production. Therefore, as the cost of producing something becomes cheaper, the price of that thing on the market also drops. Continuing. Finally, in whatsoever proportion the capitalist class, whether of one country or of the entire world market, distribute the net revenue of production among themselves, the total amount of this net revenue always consists exclusively of the amount by which accumulated labor has been increased from the proceeds of direct labor. This whole amount, therefore, grows in the same proportion in which labor augments capital, i.e. in the same proportion in which profit rises as compared with wages. So that's the end of that section. I think we've probably highlighted enough. If you still have a question, leave it in the comment section below, and we'll see what we can do. The next section is the interests of capital and wage labor are diametrically opposed, and the effective growth of productive capital on wages. We thus see that, even if we keep ourselves within the relation of capital and wage labor, the interests of capital and the interest of wage labor are diametrically opposed to each other. A rapid growth of capital is synonymous with a rapid growth of profits. Profits can grow rapidly only when the price of labor, the relative wages, decrease just as rapidly. Relative wages may fall, although real wages rise simultaneously with nominal wages with the money value of labor, provided only that the real wage does not rise in the same proportion as the profit. If, for instance, in good business years wages rise 5%, while profits rise 30%, the proportional, or the relative wage, has not increased, but decreased. If, 
Therefore, the income of the worker increased with the rapid growth of capital. There is, at the same time, a widening of the social chasm that divides the worker from the capitalist, and increase in the power of capital over labor, a greater dependence of labor upon capital. To say that the worker has an interest in the rapid growth of capital means only this, that the more speedily the worker augments the wealth of the capitalist, the larger will be the crumbs which fall to him, but also the greater will be the number of workers that can be called into existence, or the more that the mass of slaves dependent upon capital can be increased. We've thus seen that even the most favorable situation for the working class, namely the most rapid growth of capital, however much it may improve the material life of the worker, does not abolish the antagonism between his interests and the interests of the capitalist. Profit and wages remain as before, in inverse proportion. If capital grows rapidly, wages may rise, but the profit of capital rises disproportionately faster. The material position of the worker has improved, but at the cost of his social position. The social chasm that separates him from the capitalist has widened. Finally, to say that the most favorable condition for wage labor is the fastest possible growth of productive capital is the same as to say the quicker the working class multiplies and augments the power inimical to it, the wealth of another which lords over that class, the more favorable will be the conditions under which it will be permitted to toil anew at the multiplication of bourgeois wealth, at the enlargement of the power of capital, content thus to forge for itself the golden chains by which the bourgeoisie drags it in its train. Growth of productive capital and rise of wages, are they really so indissolubly united as the bourgeois economists maintain? We must not believe their mere words. We dare not believe them, even when they claim that the fatter capital is, the more will its slave be pampered. The bourgeoisie is too much enlightened. It keeps its accounts much too carefully to share the prejudices of the feudal lord, who make an ostentatious display of the magnificence of his retinue. The conditions of existence of the bourgeoisie compel it to attend carefully to its bookkeeping. We must therefore examine more closely into the following question. In what manner does the growth of productive capital affect wages? If, as a whole, the productive capital of bourgeois society grows, there takes place a more many-sided accumulation of labor. The individual capitals increase in number and in magnitude. The multiplications of individual capitals increases the competition among capitalists. The increasing magnitude of increasing capitals provides the means of leading more powerful armies of workers with more gigantic instruments of war upon the industrial battlefield. The one capitalist can drive the other from the field and carry off his capital only by selling more cheaply. In order to sell more cheaply, without ruining himself, he must produce more cheaply, i.e. increase the productive forces of labor as much as possible. But the productive forces of labor is increased above all by a greater division of labor, and by a more general introduction and constant improvement of machinery. The larger the army of workers among whom the labor is subdivided, the more gigantic the scale upon which machinery is introduced, the more in proportion does the cost of production decrease, the more fruitful is the labor. And so there arises among the capitalists a universal rivalry for the increase of the division of labor and of machinery, and for their exploitation upon the greatest possible scale. If, now, by a greater division of labor, by the application and improvement of new machines, by a more advantageous exploitation of the forces of nature on a larger scale, comment, and when Marx says forces of nature, think like electricity, he's not necessarily talking about trees, but like forces of nature, new scientific discoveries, etc., continuing. A capitalist has found the means of producing with the same amount of labor, whether it be direct or accumulated labor, a larger amount of products of commodities than his competitors. If, for instance, he can produce a whole yard of linen in the same labor time in which his competitors weave half a yard, how will this capitalist act? He could keep on selling half a yard of linen at old market price, but this would not have the effect of driving his opponents from the field and enlarging his own market but his need of a market has increased in the same measure in which his productive power has extended. The more powerful 
and costly means of production that he has called into existence enable him, true, to sell his wares more cheaply, but they compel him at the same time to sell more of them, to sell more wares, to get control of a very much greater market for his commodities. Consequently, this capitalist will sell his half yard of linen more cheaply than his competitors. But the capitalist will not sell the whole yard so cheaply as his competitors sell the half yard, although the production of the whole yard costs him no more than does that of the half yard to the others. Otherwise, he would make no extra profit, and he would get back in exchange only the cost of production. He might obtain a greater income from having set in motion a larger capital, but not from having made a greater profit on his capital than the others. Moreover, he attains the object he is aiming at if he prices his goods only a small percentage lower than his competitors. He drives them off the field, he wrests from them at least part of their market by underselling them. Comment. So basically what Marx is saying is even if you can create double the product, whatever you're selling, let's say a carpet, uh, as your competitor, you're a capitalist, you're a carpet manufacturer, and there are other carpet manufacturers out there, you develop some new machine, some new process, whatever, that enables you to produce literally double the amount of product, carpets, for the exact same cost of production. Well, you then have a tremendous amount more leeway in what you can price your product on the market while still retaining profitability. And all you have to do to beat your competitors is lower your price, 10%, 20%, whatever your competitors can't compete with. It doesn't have to be the full amount that you increased your productivity by. It just has to be enough that they can't keep up. Great, you're likely to win. But wait, didn't Marx say in the beginning, and we just recalled it in the last section, that the price of a commodity is the cost of production? Yes, but that is an average. As Marx said, it fluctuates, sometimes over, sometimes under. And he's about to get to that now, so continuing. And finally, let us remember that the current price always stands either above or below the cost of production, according as the sale of a commodity takes place in the favorable or unfavorable period of the industry. According as the market price of the yard of linen stands above or below its former cost of production, will the percentage vary at which the capitalist who has made use of the new and more faithful means of production sell above his real cost of production. But the privilege of our capitalist is not of long duration. Other competing capitalists introduce the same machines, the same division of labor, and introduce them upon the same or even upon a greater scale. And finally, this introduction becomes so universal that the price of the linen is lowered not only below its old, but even below its new cost of production. The capitalists therefore find themselves in their mutual relations in the same situation in which they were before the introduction of the new means of production. And if they are, by these means, enabled to offer double the product at the old price, they're now forced to furnish double the product for less than the old price. Having arrived at the new point, the new cost of production, the battle for supremacy in the market has to be fought out anew. Given more division of labor and more machinery, and there results a greater scale upon which division of labor and machinery are exploited, and competition again brings the same reaction against this result. So that's the end of that section. I think that that's pretty clear. So basically, there are good times to be in any given industry, and then there are times when basically everybody's using the same technology, and the competition is pretty stiff between, oh, somebody just developed a new method of you know, that revolutionizes the field. We're making carpet at, you know, double the volume for the same price. Well, really good temporarily for the person who figured that out, but eventually everybody else is going to catch on and catch up, and they're going to sell their products for a little bit less than that other guy who, remember, your carpet, you were just selling like 10% less than the others, but they still couldn't keep up. Well, you still had all that leeway. Well, now your competitors, using your technology are going to eat into that leeway. They're going to undercut you, and then you'll have a price war, and it'll go down, and eventually, as Mark says, you're back at the same situation where productivity went up, and 
prices went down, they're now way lower than they were originally. But all the capitalists are in the same relative position to each other. You no longer have that advantage. So now we're at the last section, the effect of capitalist competition on the capitalist class, the middle class, and the working class. So we just described a process of competition. What are the effects on society, particularly these three classes? We thus see how the method of production and the means of production are constantly enlarged, revolutionized, how division of labor necessarily draws after it greater division of labor, the employment of machinery, greater employment of machinery, work upon a large scale, work upon a still greater scale. This is the law that continually throws capitalist production out of its old ruts and compels capital to strain ever more the productive forces of labor for the very reason that it has already strained them. The law that grants it no respite and constantly shouts in its ear, march, march. This is no other law than that which, within the periodical fluctuations of commerce, necessarily adjusts the price of a commodity to its cost of production. No matter how powerful the means of production which a capitalist may bring into the field, competition will make their adoption general, meaning eventually everyone in the field is going to wind up using that innovation. And from the moment that they have been generally adopted, the sole result of the greater productiveness of his capital will be that he must furnish at the same price 10, 20, or 100 times as much product as before. But since he must find a market for perhaps a thousand times as much, in order to outweigh the lower selling price by the greater quantity of the sale, since now a more extensive sale is necessary, not only to gain a greater profit, but also in order to replace the cost of production, the instrument of production itself grows always more costly, as we've seen, and since this more extensive sale has become a question of life and death not only for him, but also for his rivals, the old struggle must begin again, and it is all the more violent, the more powerful the means of production already invented are. The division of labor and the application of machinery will therefore take a fresh start, and upon an even greater scale. Whatever be the power of the means of production which are employed, competition seeks to rob capital of the golden fruits of this power, by reducing the price of commodities to the cost of production. In the same measure in which production is cheapened, i.e. in the same measure in which more can be produced with the same amount of labor, it compels by a law which is irresistible a still greater cheapening of production, the sale of ever greater masses of product for smaller prices. Thus the capitalist will have gained nothing more by his efforts than the obligation to furnish a greater product in the same labor time. In a word, more difficult conditions for the profitable employment of his capital. While competition, therefore, constantly pursues him with its law of the cost of production and turns against himself every weapon that he forges against his rivals, the capitalist continually seeks to get the best of competition by restlessly introducing further subdivision of labor and new machines which, though more expensive, enable him to produce more cheaply instead of waiting until the new machines shall have been rendered obsolete by competition. If we now conceive this feverish agitation as it operates in the market of the whole world, we shall be in a position to comprehend how the growth, accumulation, and concentration of capital bring in their train, or their wake behind them, an ever more detailed subdivision of labor, an ever greater improvement of old machines, and a constant application of new machines, a process which goes on uninterruptedly, with feverish haste, and upon an ever more gigantic scale. But what effect do these conditions, which are inseparable from the growth of productive capital, have upon the determination of wages? The greater division of labor enables one laborer to accomplish the work of five, ten, or twenty laborers. It therefore increases competition among the laborers, fivefold, tenfold, or twentyfold. The laborers compete not by selling themselves one cheaper than the other, but also by doing the work of five, ten, or twenty, and they're forced to compete in this manner by the division of labor, which is introduced and steadily improved by capital. Furthermore, to the same degree in which the division of labor increases, is the labor simplified. The special skill of the laborer becomes worthless. 
it becomes transformed into a simple, monotonous force of production with neither physical nor mental elasticity. His work becomes accessible to all, therefore competitors press upon him from all sides. Moreover, it must be remembered that the more simple, the more easily learned the work is, so much the less is its cost to production, the expense of its acquisition, and so much the lower must the wages sink, for, like the price of any other commodity, they're determined by the cost of production. Therefore, in the same manner in which labor becomes more unsatisfactory, more repulsive, do competition increase and wages decrease. The laborer seeks to maintain the total of his wages for a given time by performing more labor, either by working a greater number of hours or by accomplishing more in the same number of hours. Thus, urged on by want, he himself multiplies the disastrous effects of division of labor. The result is, the more he works, the less wages he receives. And for this simple reason, the more he works, the more he competes against his fellow workmen, the more he compels them to compete against him, and to offer themselves on the same wretched conditions as he does. So that, in the last analysis, he competes against himself as a member of the working class. Machinery produces the same effects, but upon a much larger scale. It supplants skilled laborers by unskilled, men by women, adults by children. Where newly introduced, it throws workers upon the streets in great masses, and as it becomes more highly developed and more productive, it discards them in additional, though smaller, numbers. We have hastily sketched in broad outlines this industrial war of capitalists among themselves. The war has the peculiarity that the battles in it are won less by recruiting than by discharging the army of workers. The generals, i.e. the capitalists, vie with one another as to who can discharge the greatest number of industrial soldiers. The economists tell us, to be sure, that those laborers who have been rendered superfluous by machinery will find new venues of employment. They dare not assert directly that the same laborers that have been discharged find situations in new branches of labor. Facts cry out too loudly against this lie. Strictly speaking, they only maintain that new means of employment will be found for other sections of the working class. For example, for that portion of the young generation of laborers who were about to enter upon that branch of industry which had just been abolished. Of course, this is a great satisfaction to the disabled laborers. There will be no lack of fresh, exploitable blood and muscle for the capitalists, the dead may bury their dead. This consolation seems to be intended more for the comfort of the capitalists themselves than their laborers. If the whole class of the wage laborer were to be annihilated by machinery, how terrible that would be for capital, which, without wage labor, ceases to be capital. But even if we assume that all who are directly forced out of employment by machinery as well as all of the rising generation who were waiting for a chance of employment in the same branch of industry do actually find some new employment, are we to believe that this new employment will pay as high wages as did the one that they have lost? If it did, it would be in contradiction to the laws of political economy. We have seen how modern industry always tends to the substitution of the simpler and more subordinate employments for the higher and more complex ones. How then, could a mass of workers thrown out of one branch of industry by machinery find refuge in another branch unless they were to be paid more poorly? An exception to the law has been adduced, namely the workers who are employed in the manufacture of machinery itself. As soon as there is in industry a greater demand for and a greater consumption of machinery, it is said that the number of machines must necessarily increase. Consequently also, the manufacture of machines Consequently also, the employment of workers in machine manufacture, and the workers employed in this branch of industry are skilled, even educated workers. Since the year 1840, this assertion, which even before that date was only half true, has lost all semblance of truth, for the most diverse machines are now applied to the manufacture of the machines themselves on quite as extensive a scale as in the manufacture of cotton yarn, and the laborers employed in machine factories can but play the role of very stupid machines alongside of the highly ingenious machines. But in place of the man who has been dismissed by the machine, the factory may employ perhaps three children and one woman, 
And must not the wages of the man have previously sufficed for the three children and one woman? Must not the minimum wages have sufficed for the preservation and propagation of the race? What then do these beloved bourgeois phrases prove? Nothing more than that now four times as many workers' lives are used up as there were previously in order to obtain the livelihood of one working family. To sum up, the more productive capital grows, the more it extends the division of labor and the application of machinery. The more the division of labor and the application of machinery extend, the more does competition extend among the workers, the more do their wages shrink together. In addition, the working class is also recruited from the higher strata of society, a mass of small businessmen and of people living upon the interest of their capitals is precipitated into the ranks of the working class, and they will have nothing else to do than to stretch out their arms alongside the arms of the workers. Thus the forest of outstretched arms, begging for work, grows ever thicker, while the arms themselves grow ever leaner. It is evident that the small manufacturer cannot survive in a struggle in which the first condition of success is production upon an ever greater scale. It is evident that the small manufacturers are thereby increasing the number of candidates for the proletariat. All this requires no further elucidation. Finally, in the same measure in which the capitalists are compelled by the movement described above to exploit the already existing gigantic means of production on an ever-increasing scale, and for this purpose to set in motion all the mainsprings of credit, in the same measure do they increase the industrial earthquakes, in the midst of which the commercial world can preserve itself only by sacrificing a portion of its wealth, its products, and even its forces of production to the gods of the lower world. In short, the crises increase. They become more frequent and more violent, if for no other reason than for this alone, that in the same measure in which the mass of products grows, and therefore the needs for extensive markets, in the same measure does the world market shrink ever more, and ever fewer markets remain to be exploited, since every previous crisis has subjected to the commerce of the world a hitherto unconquered or only superficially exploited market. But capital not only lives upon labor. Like a master, at once distinguished and barbarous, it drags with it into its grave the corpses of its slaves, whole hecatombs of workers who perish in the crises. We thus see that if capital grows rapidly, competition among the workers grows with even greater rapidity, i.e. the means of employment and subsistence for the working class decrease in proportion even more rapidly. But this notwithstanding, the rapid growth of capital is the most favorable condition for wage labor. Well, that's the end of the text. What did you think? I'm not going to break this down too much more. I think that these last couple of sections were pretty clear. Also, I think, you know, having emphasized the breakdowns of the basic concepts in the earlier sections, probably you should be able to run with the last couple of sections more on your own. Again, any questions, leave them in the comments. We'll have a discussion. But I do just want to highlight in this last section Again, title was Effective Capitalist Competition on the Capitalist Class, the Middle Class, and the Working Class. A lot of the kinds of struggles you can see in the labor movement, trade union movement, the kinds of questions that people have tried to solve, like, well, the machines are having this effect. Uh, should we be against the machines? You know, uh, Well, now the capitalists are directly employing women and children. Uh, should we stand for the traditional structure of the family more? Like, these are all questions that people have taken on in the name of trying to resist this process and the many negative effects that it has on workers, the ultimately self-cannibalizing logic of the whole system. And of course, as Marxists, I mean, there's a solution. It's called proletarian revolution. Nothing else actually gets to the fundamental dynamics of what's driving all of these negative changes. And I think I'm going to leave it there. What do you think? Leave a comment or question below. We'll continue the discussion as always. Otherwise, thanks for listening to this nice intro to Marxist economics text and to the patrons whose names are on the screen as always for their support and encouragement. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. You can sign up for as little as $2 a month. Every donation is supportive and encouraging. I really appreciate it. Thank you. If you'd like to help out without making a donation, 
liking, subscribing, clicking the notifications bell, sharing on your social media, leaving a comment, even if it's just thanks or good video. All of that helps to boost the channel, helps to expand the audience, helps to get more people talking about socialism and trying to end capitalism. So thanks for that. Back in the real world, join or at least give a donation to an organization if you're not ready to join one. We really do need people organizing for working class political power. The Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians, Constitution Party, Alliance Party, all these other capitalist parties, they're not going to be representing our class interests. And if you don't like what's going on, who would, then you need to organize a solution. There are organizations around. Find out what's going on in your area. I suggest trying to find a more active rather than a less active one. Although if you're called to a smaller group uh, and you really want to help build it, by all means. But we do need to get active in the real world, agitating, educating, and organizing to end capitalism and build socialism. The current Omicron crisis, of course, is making that clearer than ever. And yeah, wouldn't it be nice if we had large working class political parties that could really advance a pro-working class agenda and really fight for our interests against the capitalists? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Unfortunately, we don't have it in anywhere near the numbers that we need. So we need to build those organizations. Also, if you think Omicron is bad and it is horrible, uh, I think that this is probably just a sneak peek at what climate emergency is going to be like once that starts kicking in more severely. So on that cheery note, get active as you get educated. Know your limits, but also do everything you can. And we'll catch you in the next video.